the Warren McLaugh Award of the American Society for Cybernetics, and also 1996 recipient of the Award of the Alternative Nature Philosophy Association for his work on discrete physics. He's the founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Not Theory and uh, its Ramifications, and also the editor of World Science, uh, your scientific books and uh, uh, <coughs> series on the NAS and uh, everything. He is, uh, <coughs> his interests are in the cybernetics, top, uh, topology, and uh, foundations of mathematics and physics. His work is primary in knot theory and the connection with statistical mathematics, quantum theory, algebra, uh, combinatorics, and, uh, <coughs> and uh, foundations. He worked on uh, many, many places, including Spain, uh, France, and uh, uh, England, and Brazil. He has over 170 publications. And um, his topic today is security, topology, and cybernetics, second order science. Please join me, welcome Professor Kaufman. Yes, we're all set. Good. Um, right. So um, I retitled this uh, Circularity, Topology, and Cybernetics, the Possibility of Second Order Science. Um, and um, uh, how these themes that I'm speaking about are going to interact, I think, will become clear as I go along. So I won't try to comment on that. Um, I want to begin with a couple of quotes, one from Heinz von Forster and one from John Wheeler, the physicist. Um, von Forster said, I am the observed link between myself and observing myself. Um, and in so saying, provides you with um, um, a piece of poetry or a recursion or something which you can interpret yourself in any case about the nature of observation and the nature of the self. Um, I also won't comment on it beyond that, but, um, but it, does embody, um, it does embody the fact that uh, observation is self-observation at the base. Uh, Wheeler said, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. And observation means something a little different when Wheeler talks about it uh, than when von Forster talks about it, and yet they are linked with one another. Uh, and part of the question about the relationship between cybernetics and science and the possibility of science having a different meaning or science changing or science becoming second order science or science recognizing what it already does is in the interaction between these two notions of observation. The physicist thinks of observation in terms of something quite definite and reproducible that can be done uh, and recognized by any individual who cares to enter the system of so-called observation such as measurement by a, a ruler, um, or uh, noticing um, the exact arrangement of something. Uh, and on the other hand, when you observe yourself, it's very difficult to say that you're noticing the exact arrangement of something or that you're measuring something numerical. That brings me back round to the other theme, um, peripherally at least, and that theme is the theme of topology, which is non-numerical mathematics mathematics that is based on qualitative relationships. So the, the, I mean these two quotes to resonate with one another and to begin to ask the question on which this talk is based. Uh, so let me say that again 
with this slide. Von Forster's sentence points to the recursive and self-pointing nature of the eye of a cognitive observer. John Wheeler's sentence points to the universe as a participatory universe where the real emerges in the participation of the observers with their own actions. The essence of quantum observation, which is what he was talking about, is a projection from a space of possibilities to an actuality. Um, I might go back uh, to the slide one more time. Um, Wheeler's, there are two uh, images on this slide. One is the traditional world snake eating its tail, um, uh, which goes way back and, uh, and was for a, a long time uh, the basic kind of image of, um, of the American Society for Cybernetics. Um, and uh, that kind of imagery was often used by Heinz when he talked about this sort of thing. Um, Wheeler's image is typographical, it's a U, um, and it's a symbol, typographical symbol, which stands for universe. And this is universe observing itself, and um, there are some other features to Wheeler's U. Um, it begins thin on the right and expands until it becomes an eye, which is looking back in time to its origins. So this is the Big Bang uh, made into a symbol, the U, by Wheeler. And it raises the question, remember Wheeler's quote, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. If the universe did not come to become an observer until late in the game of its expansion, what was its actuality before the observation took place? Um, or was there observation prior to that? And does the observation depend on a cognitive observer, which is being indicated by the, uh, the observer in the expanded universe? So I don't claim to answer those questions, nor did Wheeler, but he uh, encapsulated them in his insignia of the U. So the problem I'm considering in the talk is the relationship of observation with self-reference, reflexivity, and eigenform, and therefore the relationship of science with those things. Because observation and science, whatever you mean by observation, are really synonymous. Does cybernetics offer a new context for science? Does science shed new light on cybernetics? This talk is standing under these questions and hopes to understand them, and I do not claim to have answers to these questions. Uh, I want to bring in a concept or a pair of concepts that were articulated by Henri Bortoft a long time ago. Um, the, the words are compresence and coalescence. For an observer, there are two primary modes of perception, compresence and coalescence. Compresence connotes the coexistence of separate entities together in one including space or the possibility of such coexistence. Um, it is compresence that comes in um, uh, again and again if there is more than one person involved uh, because they are exchanging different points of view, but also to the one observer who sees a number of different entities together in a space. Coalescence connotes the one space holding in perception the observer and the observed inseparable in an unbroken wholeness. And that sounds poetical, but coalescence is the constant condition of our awareness. Coalescence is the world taken in simplicity. Compressence is the world taken in apparent multiplicity. Um, a simple example of coalescence is if you are wearing glasses, you're coalesced with the device called your glasses. The world you see through your glasses is a coalesced world involving the two separate compresent entities, your glasses and you. But once, you're, once those glasses are on your nose and you are looking through them, there's only one unit, unitary perception, which is the perception that happens through your glasses. Or the perception of the room itself happening through whoever you are in your mind and body. Um, in an observing system, what is observed is not distinct from the system itself. Nor can one make a complete separation between the observer and the observed. The observer and the observed stand together in a coalescence of perception. From the stance of the observing system, 
all objects are not local, depending upon the presence of the system as a whole, it is within that paradigm that these models begin to live, act, and enter into conversation with us. And I take this to be um, a statement which most cybernetics people would not object to uh, as a way of thinking about the world. Um, but if you think about the way uh, one tends to behave in relation to scientific subjects, it may uh, seem a distant or rather psychological way of looking. Um, it isn't intended to be psychological, um, and I hope that we can see how you can use this way of thinking as a lens to take a look at how science behaves. Um, here's a simple example of coalescence. Um, Spencer Brown invented um, the mark, which is... Uh, to say that he invented the right angle bracket. Well, he didn't invent the right angle bracket, but he invented the interpretation of it in a certain system, which is very simple. Um, and if you look at this, you may say, uh, Mark has been placed on the plane. Um, the plane is marked with that mark. And without that mark in the plane, the plane would be unmarked, except, of course, for the writing above. But I'm, uh, I'm talking about looking at the mark itself. On the other hand, Spencer Brown um, uses it in a slightly different way. Um, I didn't bring my laser pointer, so I'll just ask you to, uh, to look at it. Um, if you were to travel up into the upper corner of the mark from the lower side, oh, thank you. If you were to travel into the, into the mark, uh, upper corner of the mark from the lower side, you would realize that that's like walking into a room and you're on the inside of the mark. The boundaries of the room I'm delineating with the laser pointer here like that. But they aren't indicated and there's a continuity between inside and outside as I have indicated it. But if I suggest that we can think of this as the inside of the mark and that as the outside of the mark, then, um, then it becomes a, a, um, a, an indicator for a distinction that is made between the inside and the outside. Um, and uh, I hope you have done that. And if you have done that, then you are looking at this in a different way than you did before um, as, uh, as, a, uh, as a marker for a distinction between an inner part and an outer part. And having done that, um, you can't actually go back so easily if you have done that. You will keep looking at it and know that there's the inside and the outside, but you also know that there's a continuity between them and that you made it up. You made up that whole thing with my help of my, my injunction to look at it that way. You made up that whole thing about inside and outside, and you are now coalesced with the mark. Um, you, you seeing the mark as a distinction in the plane uh, is a coalescence between yourself, the mark, and the form of that distinction. So that's a, a good example, and of course it occurs all the time when you're um, doing anything at all uh, involving symbolic work or other kinds of observation. I wanted to bring in the term reflexivity, so I have a slide here. Reflexivity refers, of course, to a relationship between an entity and itself. Um, and, um, and then you can look at John Wheeler's eye again uh, from the point of view of reflexivity. Um, but then there's another question that comes up. Uh, where is the universe who observes herself? Um, in Wheeler's sense, he was thinking about the universe as a whole. Um, we like to think of taking the uh, logical notion of all and um, and bringing it forth. But, um, but if the universe uh, is observing itself, then another level has occurred. Uh, and so I've indicated the other level as though it were instantiated by nodding up the universe, um, by putting the universe into a context. The universe, of course, come, perhaps becomes its own context. It's a logical problem of how you could think of an everything which is its own context. And I bring it up because it's a lovely problem and it goes all the way back to Heinz's quote about an, obser uh, an observer observing itself or herself. 
And then one can play around with this sort of question of where are the levels of, whoops, where are the levels of observation? Uh, for example, this photograph uh, is a photograph of, um, of a camera observing the plug, which is supplying the power to a television set and the camera, um, and, uh, and exhibiting a picture of the camera. Um, and uh, that's, a for, that's a level of observation. Uh, but the other level of observation is us reading uh, that picture for ourselves and then tracing back and forth across it. Um, and then there are other senses of observation which are uh, matters of transcending the self um, and metaphorical and real and internal and quite hard to articulate except in some artistic way. And then another thing that goes on is mutuality, of course, uh, which we mentioned before. So I want to say a few things, and then I want to give a, a, a scientific example in terms of uh, geometry and topology, but we'll get to that. I, I just want to say a few things. Um, one can be aware of one's own thoughts. Thought is composed of thought. An organism produces itself through its own productions. A market is composed of individuals whose actions influence the market, just as the actions of the market influence these individuals. The participant is an observer, but not an objective observer, not separated from what is observed. There is no objective observer. There is no objective observer, and yet objects, repeatability, a world of actions, and a reality to, explore, to be explored arise in the reflexive domain. An object in itself is a symbolic entity participating in a network of interactions, taking on its apparent solidity and stability from these interactions. We ourselves are such objects. We as human beings are signs for ourselves, in the words of C.S. Peirce. The ground for discussion is not fixed beforehand. The space grows in the hands of those who explore it. Infinity beckons as an indicator of process. Now, I want to use the last few minutes to talk about a case study that I happen to like about knot theory and physical knotting. Um, and, and this has to do with um, the history of this subject of knots and topology. Um, Kelvin, Lord Kelvin, Sir William Thompson, back in the uh, 1800s suggested that the atoms that people were beginning to understand existed were vortices in the luminiferous ether and that these vortices were knotted and that that what was what constituted the particulate nature of matter. Um, and he studied knotted vortices using mathematics at the time. After all, calculus was, even advanced calculus was available at that time. And, um, and he had a theory, and it was a popular theory at the time. It, it disappeared after a while um, because the ether came to disappear. Um, it's interesting to think about that. Um, why did the ether disappear? Um, from the point of view of the physicists, it wasn't quite observable. And then eventually it became even less observable when special relativity came along. And so it had to be banished. It never was banished. People still use spaces, but they don't assign in a, in a definite way um, an ether fluid to the spaces. And it still could be the case that vortices at some level are important for particle physics. But we can ask some very simple questions about vortices, and it's still difficult. For example, have you ever seen water swirling in a vortex that was knotted? Are there knotted vortices in fluids? Kelvin's theory was that there are knotted vortices in fluids way back in the 1800s. And up until maybe last year, uh, no one had ever made a knotted vortex. Or let me put the question another way. Can you blow a knotted smoke ring? Maybe you know how to blow a smoke ring, and maybe you have done so. If you want to blow a smoke ring, what you do is you, hold, you open your mouth into an O shape, and you give an impulse to the smoke, which is already in your mouth. It goes past your lips and vortexes as it goes past your lips and becomes a smoke ring. 
uh, but to make a knotted smoke ring would require quite a contortion of the lips or the, or the tongue. And um, I, I have never seen anyone do it. On the other hand, um, ah, well, you see that, I'm sorry, I, I started talking and went, uh, went out of line from my slides, but the problem of knot theory is whether or not a tubular uh, piece of rope like that in closed form is, is uh, knotted or not. And um, I leave that one for you to worry about, but it, it's very easy to have a tangled mass of rope which seems to be knotted but isn't, as you know. Um, and on the other hand, I'm, uh, I'm following my slides now and I'll come back to what I was saying. On the other hand, um, knots can come up um, in physical situations. For example, this is a photomicrograph of knotted DNA. And this was, how was this observation made? You're looking at it, but it's, it's the result of a train of, of very carefully uh, done re reproducible things. For example, the protein, uh, there, the, the DNA itself is coated with a certain protein to make it thick. And then the whole technology of electron microscope work is involved in taking such a picture. And then, um, and then this is being looked at by you and you see that this part of the protein goes over that part of the protein and forms a bit of weaving. And to believe that, you have to actually be one of the scientists involved and really know that this isn't just a fake. Um, there's a long line of, uh, of background work to turning this into a palpable and intuitive observation for your eye. But, um, but after all that work, this became, this, pictures of this kind became proofs that DNA could be knotted. Tiny DNA could actually form knots. And there is much collaborative work uh, about how DNA behaves that supports all of that. Um, I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. But DNA knotting is also involved in DNA recombination and, um, and is able to, and observations of that knotting uh, has been very useful in understanding what kind of mechanisms are behind DNA recombination. Now I want to show you another brand of uh, another group of scientists who are good at vortices, and these are dolphins. The, this is a YouTube uh, movie. Um, I believe these dolphins actually are from SeaWorld, um, and I would like to know more about how they do this, but they're producing uh, circular water vortices and playing with them. So these are observers, non-human observers, and uh, scientists in their own way, examining the structure of vortices in a fluid. I'll skip the rest of this and go over to this recent research. Um, this is within the last year or so by Irvine and his collaborators. They created knotted vortices in water. And you might wonder, how did they do that? So this is science that creates a physical phenomenon. It's a physical phenomenon as real as any other physical phenomenon, but it's being created because no one has ever seen a knotted vortex. But these people are going to reproducibly create a knotted vortex for you. Um, and obviously they have to do it using some technology. Um, I hope this slide is visible. The upper part shows a template which is just a hole. And there is water behind the hole uh, and a field of bubbles. And, uh, and there is an impulse that's going to send a, a, a push of water through that hole. And it produces a, a vortex ring up at the top. Um, up at the top, just like it, you would if you were blowing a smoke ring. Here's another method that they use to produce a vortex. Um, that is similar to the above, but doesn't involve having a hole in a wall. It's a template. Um, you see it's a little piece of plastic uh, with an edge, a circular edge, and a, a larger circular edge at the back. And it's in the water, and it gets pulled backward quickly. 
that has the same effect as the water given an impulse forward, gets pulled backward quickly and vortexing occurs on the forward edge and there's the vortex coming out like that. So their next step was make a knotted template. Here's their knotted template. Pull that knotted template back and a, knot will, a knotted vortex will come forward. Then certain engineering problems come in because the other edge of the vortex, it's a ribbon, the other edge of that vortex um, will meet the vortex. I mean the other edge of the template will meet the vortex. It has to be a little thicker and there have to be some depressions in it which they engineered in order so that it won't disturb the vortex that was created. And then that vortex that is created only lasts for a small amount of time. Um, and then they, and how did they do that? 3D printing. 3D printing enabled them to flexibly make these templates and modify them until they got, got it engineered to, do, to work correctly. So this, regard, this, this involves a certain amount of modern technology. And here's uh, an unknotted vortex that they created, a little movie of. It breaks up after a while. And here's the knotted vortex. You saw the knotted template drop fast near the beginning. And they use high speed photography. Um, the film is a little jerky. To enable them to see it in 3D. So it's completely reproducible and visualizable. Um, and uh, this involved um, high technology. Perhaps not quite as high a technology as, the DNA, as, as seeing DNA, but this is something you can actually see in the lab directly. If you visit their lab and look at the vat of water, you can see these vortices being created um, uh, in front of you. Um, and they don't last very long, as I say. So this is a breakthrough of a certain kind. Kelvin suggested knotted vortices way back in the 1800s, but it wasn't until about a year ago that people were able to actually make knotted vortices in a fluid reproducibly. And if you think about this science, this is a creation. Um, you may say, well, I'm sure that knotted vortices occur in nature in various places, but uh, we haven't seen it. So what was done here is to actually create something. And that thing that is created is reproducible and, and can be studied so that one can ask uh, many, many questions. How does the vortex break up? What kind of recombinations does it make with itself? All sorts of scientific questions arise. But this science is coming about through the deep and complex interaction of the observers and what they're observing. And, um, and so maybe you should call this second order science. Or maybe you should recognize that science itself is of the second order in its very nature and that this example is just a, um, an example of what has been going on all the time. So I'll finish uh, with, with that remark and I will further finish uh, by quoting T.S. Eliot, who probably has the last word on the return to the beginning with the last quartet of Little Gidding. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time through the unknown, unremembered gate. When the last of Earth left to discover is that which was the beginning at the source of the largest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between the two waves of the sea, quick now, here always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one.